Hi, my name is Ian and this is Celia and we're the co-founders of Beach Break Live, a new music festival aimed at UK university students. We're here today to offer you the opportunity of buying 10% of the business for £50,000. Beach Break Live is a lot more than just a music festival. It's a three-day, three-night event which takes place on a unique and beautiful stretch of land overlooking one of the UK's premier surf beaches. It's the perfect way for students to celebrate the end of their exams and to roll out the summer. Students have got a month at the end of their academic year when they finish their exams but before they break up. As such, a spring break market, like we see in the States, has emerged in the UK and it's growing very quickly. We're the only festival in England that we know of that is 10 minutes walk from a surf beach where we've got camping on site and it's licensed for three days and three nights. We also pride ourselves in being both environmentally and socially responsible, particularly when it comes to the local area. Over the next five years, we're going to grow the festival conservatively from 2,000 to 15,000 people. We're going to turn over £6.7 million cumulatively and generate cumulative net profits of £3.7 million. Any questions? It's a confident pitch by the young entrepreneurs for the £50,000 investment they want in their spring break music festival. But they're only offering a 10% stake in return, and James Kahn wants to drill down on their financial projections. Hi, Celia. Hi, Ian. I'm James. Hi there. Uh, can you just run those numbers by me again? This year, festival just gone, we turned over £120,000. Yeah. Over you the made how much profit? We didn't. We didn't make any profit this year. Okay. So did you lose money, break even? This, this year effectively cost the business £30,000. And your forecast for next year was? Forecast for next year, um, in terms of ticket sales, is 3000 In terms of turnover, is £424,000, giving us net profit of £160,000. And how much is the ticket? The ticket last year was £65. For the three days? Yes. Yeah. And you had 2,000 people attending at £65. There was um, some of the tickets which we gave um, to kind of people who were, were creating the space, so whether they were student acts who wanted to come down and perform. Um, what percentage the of the 2,000 paid a ticket? It was 50%. Okay. Of the of the tickets that were given away, um, around 300 were effectively staff who are paid or they get a free ticket for working at the festival. I could what I would say is I wouldn't, I wouldn't mislead me by telling me you had 2,000 people attending and only half paid. Absolutely. I think you're better off saying I had 1,000 people come yeah. and they paid because yeah. otherwise it sounds like you're doing yeah. better than you are. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. my only concern therefore is that if you then say next year I'm going to get 3,000, Naturally, mm. I probably don't believe in your numbers. Right. That wasn't our aim to mislead you. Celia and Ian have alienated James Kahn, albeit inadvertently. But Duncan Bannatyne isn't happy either. You can't continue to give right. people free tickets instead of paying them. The law in this country states there's a minimum wage, and you have to pay people a minimum wage. Just in terms of the, the staffing of the event, every festival in the UK pretty much uses volunteers, and that is how they are specified, and I imagine that probably is for land revenue reasons, they use volunteers to staff their festival. I totally agree with yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. You are, I and do, and can I just thought, say, yeah. you are totally, totally right. I was going to come in there yeah. um, and tell you exactly, because that is fact. <coughs> Thank you. They're classified as volunteers, yeah. and you do not have to legally pay the yes. minimum wage. This doesn't work, because there's not enough meat in it, there's not enough money to pay everybody. Oh, I there's see. a lot of labour that didn't get paid. Are you saying it's an our When cost? these costs are taken in, to consideration for last year, you made a loss much higher than 30,000 last year if you paid the people who got free tickets. I will make a loss again this year. I hope you invest in you and it'll be proven right. OK, but I'm out. A furious Duncan Bannatyne has walked away from any deal. It's an early setback for the pair and they desperately need to get their pitch back on track. Guys, what's your background, both of you? Four years ago, when I was at university, I started running student events, these weekends or, or three-day events to different places in Europe. And that grew to five universities in the Midlands and a number of reps selling the tickets. And since then, I've spent a year and a half working as a consultant in a revenue growth consultancy in London. I left that two months before kind of the festival to focus on the festival. Celia? 
Um, I started a festival in Birmingham with my flatmate called the Vale Festival, which was a charity festival in aid of Sudan. Um, that pulled two, th two and a half thousand people in its first year. It's now at six thousand people. And then following that, I joined a company which basically ran ten events for ten thousand students ago. So I've got a lot of experience in putting on large-scale events for students. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> The duo are putting up an impressive fight, helped by cool heads and impressive CVs. Now, Deborah Meaden, who made her millions in the West Country's leisure and entertainment industries, is ready to have her say. You've made a good presentation. I also think you've hit on a quite an opportunity, and I'm going to make you an offer. And that's for two reasons. You're very good. You've got a good idea here. I think the other side of why I'm interested is I think I would be able to add. It's my region, I'm involved in entertainment, I'm involved in taking people down to the area. So I think that, you know, the fit there could be very good. So I'm very impressed with the whole package. I'm going to offer you all of the money and I want 40% of the business. Okay. But let me tell you where I am, see if okay. that helps you. Yeah. Deborah's made you an offer of 40%, which is uncanny, uh, because 40% was uh, a figure I had in mind as well. Uh, I'm not of the mind to undercut her, because that's the figure that I had in mind. Yeah. So you've got an identical offer hmm. to Deborah's from me. Okay. okay. Thank you. Two rival offers. But both dragons are demanding four times the equity stake Celia and Ian had wanted to part with. But two other dragons are still in, and Peter Jones is ready to show his hand. I'm concerned about the fact this could be just one event. And it, you, you only need one or two things to occur, mm -hmm. as we know. Mm -hmm. Somebody dying of a drugs overdose or something happening at your event, it's cancelled. Yeah. And, it, and it won't happen again. And then the reputation of also your mm -hmm. company you won't get a further licence, yeah. and, and I'm concerned about that. But actually, I'm really interested in it. Really? Thank you. <laughs> so, my offer to you is I will give you £50,000 for 30% of the company. Mm -hmm. mm. And at the end of the event, when we make the profit, and that amount is repaid, mm -hmm. I'll drop my stake down to 20%. Okay. It's confusing and interesting yes. at the same time. A bidding war has erupted in the den. A determined Peter Jones is trying to clinch the investment by demanding less equity and offering the chance for them to buy back 10%. Will James Kahn, though, now enter the fray? I think what I'd like to propose is happy to do the 50,000. Um, I'm not going to get into this loan and take the money back and put the money in. Put the money in, it's straight option, equity, James. straight equity, Peter, Choose. you've had your chance, please let me finish now, yeah? So I think what I'll do is I'll come in at 25%, make it straightforward, nice and clean, it is what it is, with the full amount of money you're looking for. The tension is rising in the den as four dragons pit themselves against each other. Will Theo Pafitis or Deborah Meaden decide to improve on their original offers? I'm going to do something that's quite unusual because um, actually in, the, in my offer, mm -hmm. it doesn't leave you with the combined majority shareholding. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And actually I think that's quite important. And I've got a question for a fellow dragon. Um, my question is going to be that I would be prepared to say that I would take 35% if <laughs> the dragon sat to my right would be interested in doing this at the same level. Uh, Deborah couldn't actually shoot me down in flames at the moment because uh, uh, I might be talking out of turn, but I'd be quite happy to work to 30%, not 35%, um, purely because I think with Deborah's input as far as this industry is concerned, and all our other contacts, um, we can certainly grow the business a lot faster. Do you guys want to just take two minutes out and give some thought? Is that out? okay? <laughs> Thanks. Oh <my> God. <laughs>
It's one of the most complicated negotiations the Den has seen. Deborah Meaden and Theo Pafitis are now jointly offering £50,000 for a 30% stake, underpinned by Deborah Meaden's local expertise. Peter Jones is also at 30%, but with the carrot of a 10% equity reduction after he's offset his original risk. And there's a 25% no-strings-attached offer from James Kahn. Now, in a bid to gain the upper hand, Celia and Ian decide to make a counter-offer of their own. We've said that we'd be prepared to sell 20% of the business um, and we'd ideally have two of you involved, and that would be Deborah and Peter, with the option to buy a further 10%. The issue for me is the, the bit that I will certainly bring, yeah. amongst many other things I would like to think, yeah. was my contacts yes. within the leisure tourism yeah. area in this region. Mm -hmm. We know that can be quite hard work at times. Mm -hmm. And that means that I would have to commit right. quite a bit of time to this. Yeah. And for me, 20% yeah. isn't going to work. I mean, what you've come back with is very clever, it's brilliant. And I think you're also leveraging on the element of competition amongst the dragons, which is what it's all about. So I would be happy to compromise with you and say, 50,000 for 25%. Mm -hmm. mm. With the option to uh, for us to buy you out still. Yeah, with the, I, and I absolutely, and I'm happy for that to have a flexible option. That okay. Not written in stone, but yeah. it's there for to, you to discuss. You need it. With Deborah Meaden refusing to manoeuvre, Peter Jones is playing hard to win the deal. It's decision time for the duo. We know that working with any of you guys would be hugely beneficial to the business, um, but we've, we've have reached a decision. Based on the principles that we came in here with, we'd yeah. be very happy to take... Yes. Because... Fantastic. Thank you. Well, well Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Ian and Celia have done it, cleverly negotiating their way through a fierce bidding war to walk away with the £50,000 investment they came for. And Peter Jones is their new business partner. We've been doing lots of practice pitching for today, so we feel well rehearsed and really excited to go in. The duo are looking to breathe new life into a centuries-old tradition. I think it's exciting to innovate in an industry that hasn't really seen much change for the last four or five hundred years. Hi Dragons, my name's Oliver. My name's Ruth. And we're here today to ask for £60,000 in exchange for 8% of our business, Churchill Gowns. Now it might surprise you to know that this year alone in the UK, over a million students will graduate from university. That values the graduation gowning market at over £62 million just here in the UK. Now traditionally, some universities have an exclusive supplier in exchange for certain benefits, such as staff gowns and even commission for every gown that's rented. But it's bad news to the students, who end up playing inflated costs and having a complete lack of choice when it comes to renting their gowns. That's where Churchill Gowns comes in. Our gowns are 30% less to rent and 80% less to buy than from other suppliers. We've been trading for one year and have stock for 30 UK universities. What's more, Every single gown that we make is made entirely from recycled plastic. Each gown that we manufacture saves the equivalent of these 28 plastic bottles from ending up in landfill or polluting the ocean and instead turns them into something truly useful and practical that looks and feels exactly like any other graduation gown. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us today. Of course, we'd like to welcome any questions you might have, but first we have your very own graduation gown for you. It's a textbook presentation from Oliver Adkins and Ruth Nichols. Tuka, this one's for you. Thank you. <laughs> who are looking for a £60,000 investment for an 8% share in their eco-friendly graduation gowns business. Oh my God, a, you look like something out of Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> you look very uh, judge-like. <laughs> Important. First to cross-examine the entrepreneurs is Deborah Meaden. Guys, I left school at 16, never went to university. 
So this is a market I know nothing about. So at the moment, who are the dominant players? So there's one large incumbent supplier. They own probably 85% of the UK market. Right, gosh. Yes. Who owns the design? We've checked with our lawyers and they've said that no intellectual property rights would exist because the gowns are from medieval England, you know, they're 500 years old. So what's your plan? In terms of our business model, we want to sell directly to the students. And in doing that, we cut out the universities and therefore don't have to pay those commissions. OK, so you want to disrupt the gowning business. We do. <laughs> it sounds to me your competition is very established. We believe we can compete on price and on quality, and obviously we're sustainable, so there are a number of things that differentiate us. Students want to change, they want to save money. So the incumbent suppliers would usually charge around £270 if you wanted to buy a full set. We charge £79. Gosh. So talk me through your revenue model. This year we're expecting to turn over £250,000. Next year we hope to increase that to around £475,000. The year after that, £1.1 million. If I can um, draw a comparison to last year, we've done about 700% more sales this year. Oliver and Ruth are top of the class so far as they reveal an impressive leap in sales already. But the dragon who started her multi-million pound empire from her university bedroom has been thinking about the last time she was kitted out in a robe. Now, it's 13 years since I graduated, and students, as you'll know, are like sheep. So we just all got herded in, we got measured up, and you just had a conveyor belt. I, it just seems really strange to me that one or two of the people in our group might have gone and rented it off the internet because it was a little bit cheaper. So what is your price to rent versus the competitor? And a full set is £34. That, that doesn't include shipping. Shipping is £5. So yours is 34. What is your competitor price to rent? Um, somewhere between 45 and 65 pounds. So 39 pounds to rent from you, and you're saying the starting price is at the university of 45. A six pound saving isn't enough to make me want to do that. So I'm not convinced that going down that route for the rentals is the right way forward. It's a setback for Oliver and Ruth, as Sarah Davies thinks the duo must try harder with their profits on gown higher. Now Tuka Suleiman wants to know how the gowns business got off the ground. What was your initial investment in this business? So I came across a company in Australia that had a business model that I loved. It was directly selling to the students and had all the USPs that we've mentioned previously. So they put in some initial investment. How much was it? Can you talk numbers? Uh, 40,000 pounds from those two gentlemen in Australia. We then... For what share? They individually have 23%. Wow. Which is 46%. 46. Together, we then went out to find more investment. How much? Um, and that was for a net of about £220,000. For what percentage? They own 26%. And so, that's a consortium so of... Between you, what do you guys own? 28%. 28%. I think you're in trouble. I think you've made a potentially fatal error. You've given away 72% of your company before ultimately it's really started. Because you need to raise money, you're going to dilute. And you'll end up with a very tiny percentage of a company that currently isn't performing and you'll lose interest because there's no point in you running this business unless you're properly incentivized and focused and you know that there is a decent return for you at the end of it. So I'm going to be really quick with this one. I think that you've made some real schoolboy errors. And for that reason, I'm out. The revelation that the entrepreneurs have given away almost three quarters of their company has lost them their first dragon in Peter Jones. Tej Lalvani wants to know more about those shareholders down under. Now, the Australian company that you mentioned, what are their sales? We don't know their, their, their revenues. We know that they're one of the most dominant suppliers. But they're investors in your business and you don't know how much they're selling. We, we kind of have a, a rough idea of, of turnover, which is probably in the, in the range of kind of half a million. 
they've invested in your business and you've spoken to them, but they're not willing to reveal what their sales are. How many years have they been in business? Um, seven years. Seven years and they're doing half a million pound sales. I'll tell you what I'm thinking here. That is concerning for me in terms of market size or penetration. And then, you know, as Peter said, you really have made a flaw in terms of giving away too much equity in your business. I don't want to be the majority shareholder and you to be the minority is not your business anymore, unfortunately. So for that reason, I'm going to say I'm out. Guys, I do see two very credible entrepreneurs in front of me. However, I'm not on board with your business model as it stands. But it definitely isn't an investment for me, so I'm out. Sarah Davies makes it three dragons to take themselves out of the investment equation. And Deborah Meaden has concerns about the entrepreneur's lack of skin in the game. So, guys, I think there is a real structural problem with your business in terms of the investment you've already taken on board at 46%. Immediate alarm bells. Honestly, the business isn't worth what you say it's worth at the moment. But I love anything that disrupts something. Students are bang on this, you know. They're engaged in a very different way than they were 10 years ago. They want the sustainability, they want all of the added stuff. So, I'm going to make you an offer. But it's important to me that between us we would have half of the business. OK. So, I'm going to offer you all of the money, the 22% of the business. The shares that I'm buying, I would expect to come from your other shareholders. But there is no point doing that deal unless you think you can talk to your other shareholders and that they will agree to it. Sure. OK, thank you. A lifeline from Deborah Meaden, who wants to redress the equity balance in the business by specifying that her 22% must come from the other shareholders. Now, has Tuka Suleiman spotted a synergy in the business with his fashion empire? A normal student needs a gown. What else does a student need during the year? Don't forget, I have a menswear chain yep. that produces shirts, yep. suits, all sorts of things. If I'm going to invest, is there a bigger picture here for me? There are some, some other products we've been looking at upselling through the website. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are kind of university-related products. Yep. So it could be a tie with your university colours, yep. scarves, things like this. Mm. There is a, a big opportunity to diversify as well. I'm torn between what this business needs and where you're at. My offer would be very similar to Deborah's, but I want more. I'd want to dilute your two other shareholders by 50%. So I will give you all the money, but I want 36%. OK. Can we take a minute? Sure. Have a little chat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tuka Suleiman joined Deborah Meaden in making a play for the business. But at 36%, he wants over four times the 8% equity on offer. Deborah Meaden wants 22%, giving her, Oliver and Ruth, a collective 50% stake. Yeah, I think they'd struggle to be diluted any further than that. Yeah. I think we should take yeah, it. Will the numbers add up for these Cambridge alumni? You want to take on us? <laughs> Thank you both for your offers. Taking everything into account and also our current shareholders, Would like to go ahead with you, please. Oh yes! Oh yes! Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. Yes. Thank you. I'm going yeah. to take this off <laughs> yeah. first. That I'm going to become a dragon, <laughs> again, and then I'm going to go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very pleased. Thank you very much. You're very, very exciting. good. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I love disrupting a market. That is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Deborah Meaden comes out top in the den as she lands a potential 22% of the business while Oliver and Ruth walk away with an A-plus investment of £60,000. I think we'll definitely get on with Deborah. I think she's definitely got the right attitude to take on this market. Is the incentive to invest in that the very thought about disruption that excited you? Uh, yes. £279 to students for gowns is taking the mickey. Feels like we've graduated from the den. <laughs> Thank you.
Last into the den, a 25-year-old entrepreneur from Belgium. I can't believe I'm actually doing this. I cannot believe it. A businesswoman confident she has a unique solution to a problem faced by many wheelchair users. I'm a bit nervous, um, but I feel okay. It's just, uh, yeah, controlling the nerves, keeping it zen. <laughs> My name is Corinne Stiles, founder and CEO of Stiles Design and developer of Wheel Air, an award-winning battery-powered airflow backrest cushion. Wheel Air increases your comfort and keeps you cool, combining function with style. Today, I'm here to sell you 15% of my company in return for 75,000 pounds. So how does it work? As you can see on that wheelchair, there's a unit underneath. That unit basically sucks air in at the bottom, pushes it up and then gently pushes it out on your back, creating a gentle feeling of cooling. We believe that with Wheel Air, we can capture 45 million pounds in the UK alone. Now we've had lots of interest so far and are working with some fantastic Paralympic athletes, such as double Paralympian Michael Kerr, who I've got with me today. With your help, we want to go into distributing and into manufacturing, because with your help, we can change every wheelchair user's life. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to try it out? I would actually, yes. A slick pitch from Corinne Stiles, who's looking for £75,000. You have a simple remote. In exchange for 15% of her company, making air conditioning cushions for wheelchairs. It's already. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. It's worked in seconds for Deborah Meaden, and she's keen to get some first hand feedback from the invention's Paralympian user, Michael Kerr. Michael, um, how long have you been using this? Um, I've been trialling this on and off now for a few months. It's a great piece of kit for, um, for somebody like myself. Um, I had a spinal cord injury back in 2000, um, resulting in paralysis from the chest down. So when I get too hot, I just keep getting hotter and hotter because I don't have the ability to sweat anymore. So having something like this obviously helps me regulate my body temperature. Thank you. Thank you. A winning endorsement from a Paralympic athlete is not a bad start to Corinne's pitch. And now Tuka Suleiman's wondering what's driving her ambition. So what gave you the inspiration? So there was a woman at university who's a wheelchair user and she said, you know, a lot of people have overheating issues. Maybe you can make a cooling clothing line. I said, well, I'll drop the clothing line, but I can solve the issue. And what about yourself? What's your background? So I studied um, in Amsterdam. So I did a bachelor's in international fashion management there for four years. And then I came to Glasgow to do my master's in international business and entrepreneurship. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> All with distinction. Perhaps I can give you a job. Yeah. <laughs> a grade A student putting her skills to good use. Corinne is getting top marks from Tuka Suleiman. But Deborah Meaden wants a progress report on the business. Just so I understand where you are at the moment, are you actually in production? Um, no, currently we have uh, four prototypes at work. Um, we currently don't have the funding to go into manufacturing, so that's why we're here today. And um, made in the UK at the moment? So the foam is made in Italy um, and the cover is made in Tunisia. So, and the rest is made in, in Glasgow and will be in the UK. And do you know about how much it's going to cost to make? Yes, it costs us £127. £127 to make, so what do you think you're going to be selling it out at? Uh, it's retailing at 575 I think that's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very cleverly designed, simple product. Yeah. And the raw materials are not that expensive. If you really wanted to do volume on it, um, and I know a little bit about textiles, um, you could probably bring that down dramatically. The king of outsourcing, Tuka Suleiman, spots the potential to lower Corinne's production costs. Jenny Campbell's more interested in how much the product will set the consumer back. How did you come to a price point of 575? If I price it too low, you don't get the credibility. If it's too high, no one will buy it. Um, but with 575, it covers our overheads really well. 
I think you've got a great product and it, uh, it solves a, a very important purpose. Um, I think it's just the cost, 575 pounds, is a lot. And I think you could end up struggling to convince people. But if you want to get a bigger market, you want something that's more affordable. Tej Lalvani thinks the product's price tag could limit its mass market appeal, which has left Peter Jones wondering how Corrine's future sales are likely to stack up. What's your forecast, your three-year forecast? Three-year forecast uh, total is... Um, the, um, so as always call it calculated in, in Dutch. Um, so it'll be about um, two and a half million, I guess, uh, turnover. And how many products would that be? Um, that is, oh, I've got this all written down exactly, but it'll be... Um, would you like to see the sheet that has all the... No, no, I, w I just want you to tell me. Okay. Um, I think we're selling about a thousand products by year three. A thousand um, different, a thousand total of these products? No, they'll be, um, do you mean combined? So what are the products you, you're, you're pitching this today? but there's other products you haven't created yet. Uh, we're actually applying for a grant now to develop a more technically advanced version of this, that's heating and cooling. But, but instead of applying for grants, why don't you try and create a business, make some money and reinvest the money? I instead do, of using I do. public <laughs> funds? I do. Um... The th whole thing about entrepreneurship is that you're trying to create a business and be self-sustainable and build a business and utilize those retained profits. When they're at grant, we can hire people, so it's basically but just without profit. You can hire profit. a lot more people if you start making money in your business. Yeah, and we will. How many of these will you sell in three years? So at least 200 in the first year, so it's, uh, 450 in the second year. Um, so I feel like, say, 800. 800. And what will be the revenue if you sell 800? Um, 800, um, um, 4 million. And, and what will be your gross margin? Um, gross margin of that, um, I don't know by heart, I think um, 300? No, um, sorry. What's um, happened here? I don't know, I have my numbers, but I just, I knew I have a turnover for five years per month and I knew exactly which, how much I sell. But Corinne, you're month. a distinction student. Yes. So Corinne, what's going on now? Is this pressure? Are you feeling pressure? Yes. It's doing all the numbers just like out of my head. Okay, we're at 300K. Mm -hmm. And now valuation. Where do you come to a valuation of half a million where you sit today with a product that's not yet launched? I am so sorry, but I am going to pass out. I don't know. Um, I'm seeing only oh. black. Want some water sit here. down. Here, I'll jump um, in. Sit, sit down here. Sit down here. Oof, I'm sorry. No, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Take a break. It's fine, like, don't worry. Breathe I'm really not feeling well. It's just my sugar sometimes drops. It's fine, it's fine, don't worry. It's okay, I've got the cooling cushion on. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> the pressure of the den has proved too much for Corrine. Everything goes, goes black. Forced to abandon her pitch midway, she's taken out to recover. The interrogation by the dragons has left holes in her financial forecast. But feeling better, Corinne decides to return to the den. How are you feeling? I shake you a little bit better. I'm so sorry. That's all right. About that. It's straight back to business for Jenny Campbell, who's quick to turn up the heat. Corrine, let me tell you where I am. Um, there's a lot of things I don't like. You clearly come under pressure under your numbers, despite you being a distinction student. You haven't shown the business acumen that comes with this, not to me. The thing I take most issue with is an 85% margin for a product where you're trying to help people. I take issue with it and I don't have confidence in you becoming a businesswoman and this being scalable. And for that reason, Corrine, I am out. Thank you. Affronted by Corrine's markup and lacking confidence in her business skills, 
Jenny Campbell becomes the first dragon out. Can health tycoon Tej Lalvani revive this rapidly deflating pitch? I think there's, a, uh, there's quite a bit of risk. However, I think that if it's a unique product with the right support and the right backing, it could do okay. So, I'll offer you half the money for Twenty percent of the company. Tej Lalvani comes to the rescue, breathing new life into the entrepreneur's pitch, but he's only willing to put up half of the seventy-five thousand pounds, and that's for a whopping twenty percent of the company. A double deal with textile tycoon Tuka Suleiman could be right up Kareen Street, but can he come up with a two-for-one offer? I'll tell you where I stand. I don't think you can work on such huge margins, if you could bring the cost of that unit down to 40 pounds, then you could retail that for 199. How does that sound to you? It would be ideal if we can get the cost price down that low, but we've just not been okay. able to manage Look, ourselves. There are a lot of question marks. Um, I'm the dragon for you. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> I, think, I think you know that. Mm. Um, and I'll share the risk with Tej. So I'll give you the other half of the money for 20%. Quite a turnaround. The whole £75,000 split between two dragons with connections in global health and textile businesses. Peter Jones has held back since Kareen almost fainted during his financial cross-examination. Has he reached a verdict? What I feel is that there is a real huge opportunity, actually, for your product to enter the market. And you can see how it's potentially life-changing. I'm going to make you an offer. But mine is conditional upon the fact that if Deborah is interested, that I would share with Deborah. I'm going to offer you half of the money for just 15%. So, Corinne, um, I don't know if you know a very close member of my family is in a wheelchair. As a result of my sister's problems, um, I've actually been involved with the project designing a wheelchair. OK. I would have made you an offer in any event. But Peter and I work very well together. We've worked on many other projects, and I know we can both add value. So I'm going to make you an offer. It will be for half of the money. It will be for 15%, and it will be to match Peter's offer. OK. It's a massive turnaround as a Mead and Jones partnership undercuts Tej Lalvani and Tuka Suleiman's joint offer by 10%. And it's not over yet. I would just say that I would change my offer to 15%, to match Deborah and Peter's if Tej agrees. I don't think there's anyone here that's more passionate about health. Uh, that is my business. That's what we do. We help improve people's lives. So I'm willing to drop my percentage from 20 to 15%. Yes. To match Tukas. This is a very difficult decision. Um... And I'll tell you what we'll do. If we get our money back, I'd drop it to 10. You've gone 30, 25, shit, and the poor lady hasn't said anything. Well, no, it just shows how passionate we are about what she's <laughs> because doing. Because I don't want you to have it. Four dragons have set out their offers, and Corrine's firmly in the driving seat. Peter and Deborah, are you um, willing to match what they said with giving me back percentage if you make back the money? I'm happy to drop on the repayment down to 10%. Very happy to. Um, I think we're going to go with Deborah up here. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Hey. <laughs> Good. Very pleased. <laughs> Brilliant. Well done. Thank you. Corinne, we were happy to get you a better deal for the other dragons anyway, so. I know. Do I just leave? Yes. Okay. 
Kareen exits the den, but this time feeling triumphant with a pledge of £75,000 and two seasoned dragons. I wanted that. <laughs> I can't believe how much I turn around, you know, it's like they're trying to break you just to see, and then in the end they're like, oh, you're fantastic. <laughs> what? <laughs>